Hello, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. My name is Stephanie, and today I'm going to be talking about the importance of sleeping, breathing, and airway, and why we're at the dentist talking about these things. Now, you might be watching this video because you were recently diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, and you're looking for alternative treatments to the CPAP. Or maybe you're here because you or your partner snore so loudly that you have to sleep in separate bedrooms, and your dentist said they might be able to help you. Or maybe you're not here for yourself. Maybe you're watching this video for a child who was recently diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, or is having issues wetting the bed, and your dentist said they might be able to help. Now, everything that I just mentioned might seem really different, but by the end of this video, one of my hopes is for you to understand that they all might have a common root cause, and that common root cause could be a compromised airway. Now, in the beginning, I am going to focus pretty heavily on children, and that might seem kind of strange, especially if you're here for an adult or for yourself, but what we know now is that children with sleep disorder breathing often grow into adults with obstructive sleep apnea, and some of the things I'm about to talk about you might recognize as things you suffered from yourself uh, during childhood. So let's go ahead and get right into it. There is a silent crisis in America. Research has shown that nine out of every 10 people in America suffer from one or more of these conditions. Now the conditions on the left, things like ADD, ADHD, snoring, low IQ, swollen tonsils, these are all commonly associated with children while the conditions on the right, like depression, anxiety, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. These are all commonly associated with adults and they can overlap. Now, how do these conditions start? And how can we start noticing the warning signs in our children? Well, let's take a look. I want you to examine these three kiddos right here. And I want you to think to yourself, do they look healthy to you? And if not, what do you see? Well, I'm gonna point out what I see. Starting with this first little boy over here on the left, his name is Michael. I'd like you to remember his name and I'd like you to remember his face because I will be talking about him further on in the video. Now, Michael looks like a pretty average kid with perhaps a weight issue because you notice he has here this double chin. But the thing to know about Michael is he's a normal size and weight for his age. What's giving him the illusion of childhood obesity is a retronathic or underdeveloped jaw. Basically, his upper and lower jaws are not growing forward the way they should, so it's giving him this illusion of a double chin. The little girl in the middle, she has these dark circles under her eyes, which is called venous pooling, and it's not something we commonly associate with children. She also has these dimples on her chin, which could mean she's clenching or grinding her teeth at night. And finally, finally, the little boy over here on the right, he has these dry, red, cracked lips, which is a likely sign that he's breathing through his mouth instead of breathing through his nose. And he also has a bit of a posture issue because he has this cant to his shoulders. Now, I want you to do the same thing with these three little girls. What do you notice about them? Well, let me tell you what I see. First off, this little girl here on the far left, I notice her head posture. It's tilted to the side, and that's something called forward head posture. And it's something that our bodies will naturally do when we're not getting in enough oxygen. We'll tilt our head to the side and stretch it up a little bit to open up our airway so we can get in more air. Now, if left untreated, this posture is gonna stick with this little girl for the rest of her life, which is going to lead to shoulder, neck, and back pains later on in life. How about the little girl in the middle? I mean, she's an absolute cutie, but check out the dark circles under her eyes. And more importantly, check out this tiny, tiny chin that is so far back, she can't properly close her mouth and get proper lip seal. And then lastly, this little girl here on the far right, she seems really tired. She has these rosy red cheeks, like she's just been running around uh, and has been breathing heavily to get in oxygen. She also has the dry red cracked lips. She has the forward head posture and the cant to her shoulders. And one common thing about all these children is they look tired. So what's going on? And what if everything that we just talked about, things like crowded and crooked teeth, chronic allergies, difficulties in school, dark circles under the eyes. What if they are all linked to a common root cause? And what if that common root cause is a compromised airway? Well, what could be causing that compromised airway? Well, it could be due to narrow dental arches, and those narrow dental arches could be due to things like soft diet, low tongue position, and limited to no breastfeeding. So where did all this come from? A mouth like this is pretty common nowadays in dental offices. And while 
it's common. It's not exactly normal because this is what a normal or a perfect five-year-old's mouth should look like. Notice there's space in between the baby teeth with an, leaving enough room for the adult teeth to come in. As I mentioned, this is a perfect five-year-old's mouth, but it is such a rarity in dental offices nowadays, we're actually calling it an endangered species. So what's going on? Are all of a sudden our children being born with large teeth? I mean, that's actually what I was told when I was a teenager. I remember being 18 years old, sitting in the dental office, getting ready for my final exam, uh, dental exam, before I go off to school. And the dentist came in with my panoramic film. He put it up on the light box and said, oh my God and just pause. And here I'm thinking that my 18 year streak of being in the no cavity club is coming to a crashing end and I'm about to start college with no teeth. But then after a few agonizing moments, he looked over at me and said, your teeth and sinuses are massive. Not once did he comment on the size of my jaws in correlation to my sinuses and teeth, just that my teeth and sinuses are really big. So let's now take a look at normal craniofacial growth, what it should look like for the average person between the ages of two and 17. Each line represents one year of growth. And as you can see here up in the cranium, there is some growth, not a lot, but if you take a look at the lower one third of the face, and I'm talking about the orbits of the eyes and lower, there is an explosion of growth that, growth that happens in those 15 years. And as you can see here by these statistics, by the age of two, we're all about 55% developed. By the age of four, we're anywhere between 73 and 78% developed. And by the age of 12, we're anywhere between 89 and 95% developed with girls growing a little bit faster than boys in the early years. And as you were able to tell by that diagram, we know that normal cranial facial growth is wider forward and downward. So why are so many children suffering from abnormal growth and development? Well, to dig into those questions, pun intended, I'm gonna introduce you to the research done by Dr. Robert Coraccini. Now, Dr. Robert Coraccini was an anthropologist with over 30 years of research under his belt. He's written books and articles, but today we're going to focus on his fossil studies and his isolated population studies, starting with his fossil studies. Now, Dr. Coraccini studied the human skull from about 400 years ago, and he noticed a big difference between these ancient skulls versus modern skulls of today. And the biggest difference was the size of the jaws. They were wider, more forward grown, with enough room for all 32 teeth, meaning there was less instances of malocclusion or crooked teeth, and also lower instances of periodontal disease. But if you fast forward, forward to today, the modern human, our jaws are much smaller, which means we don't have enough room for all 32 of our teeth. Most of us nowadays get our wisdom teeth extracted, and sometimes there's some of us that need even more teeth extracted, like our bicus bicuspids, uh, to make room for braces, which means we have a lot of malocclusion. We have a high rate of, of crooked teeth, and we also have a higher rate of periodontal disease. Now, at the same time, Dr. Coraccini was studying these isolated populations. And when I say isolated populations, these were modern humans that lived a lot differently than we do here in the West. And what he noticed about these people is that their jaws were wider. They were more forward grown. There was enough room for all 32 of their teeth. There was very low instances of crowded crooked teeth and also really low instances of periodontal disease. And the biggest difference between these people and people over in the West, like America, is a big cultural difference, right? They breastfed their children for many years, two, three, four years, right? And then they went on to a hard food diet. Here in the West, we are used to eating processed foods. Like we love our chicken nuggies and our mac and cheese, but these people were eating hard root vegetables and dried meats. And because of that, they developed a little bit differently. So what Dr. Coranchini concluded was that dietary consistency and toughness promotes proper bone growth. And when non-resistant processed foods became ubiquitous or more common after industrialization, crooked teeth showed a rapid rise. And we know that soft, food or processed foods increase the underdevelopment of the upper and lower jaws. And uh, also, Dr. Coraccini was able to observe what happened with these cultures as Western diet was introduced. And what he found was mind-blowing, because what he found within the first generation of a diet change, 50% of the people born needed some type of orthodontic intervention in their lifetime. By the second generation, that jump number jumps to 70%. And by the third generation, that number is up to 85%. 
Now, here in the West, we're about fifth or sixth generation post-industrial post age. And soft processed foods really became popular around the industrialization time because we all went to work. We're working long hours, 8, 9, 10, 11 hours a day, and sometimes we don't get a lot of breaks for work. So we developed food that was softer, easier to choose, so we can kind of wolf it down and then get back. So you can imagine that our rates of people needing orthodontia are way higher than 85% now, because again, we're about fifth or sixth generation out. And this information is staggering because it tells us that most malocclusion is acquired, not inherited. And we know this because it takes 27,000 years for genetic mutation to express itself in 51% or more of the population. Now you go back 400 years ago and it was practically unheard of. And with Dr. Coraccini's research, he was able to see this change happen within just one generation so this throws out the idea that I had braces because my mom had braces and my future children are going to need braces because I had braces. It throws out the idea of genetics and it reintroduces the idea that malocclusion is a disease caused by Western culture. But what do I mean by Western culture? Well, first of all, we're not breastfeeding our children for two, three, four years at a time. As women in the workforce, we just don't have that opportunity to breastfeed our children for that long. Sometimes we're lucky if we get three months off of work to bond with our children. Or sometimes our babies don't latch, or it's a personal choice for the mom to not breastfeed, which is perfectly fine because then we have bottles, and bottles is a, they're a great way for our children to get the nutrition that they need. However, there is a big uh, function difference between breastfeeding and bottle feeding. So when a baby feeds with the mommy's breast, they take the nipple into their mouth and it pushes, the tongue pushes the nipple up to the roof of the mouth, training it to stay in the proper position. And then the milk doesn't really flow out that easily. So the baby really has to work their oral facial muscles in order to get that milk out. So it really gives them an oral facial workout. But with the bottle, it's almost the exact opposite. The nipple of the bottle actually holds the baby's tongue in the lower and backward position. And the reason that it's lower and back is because the milk flows out so freely from the bottle that if the baby doesn't block off their airway, they could choke. So then right after that, we go to a soft food diet, things like these pureed baby foods, these uh, Puffs graduates and the baby uh, apple sauces. Now, I've never had children myself, but I will unapolog unapologetically say that I have stolen one of these things from every single one of my uh, nieces and nephews, these little your first finger foods, because it says right on the packaging, melt in your mouth good. Number one, they're delicious, absolutely true. And number two, as soon as you put these little puffs on your tongue, they dissolve, they disappear, which means our children have pretty much a zero risk of choking on this type of food, which is great. We wanna make sure that our children are safe. However, in order for them to have the proper oral facial development, this is what they should be eating. But I'm gonna put a hard pause on this slide because this can be alarming, especially if you have little ones in your life that aren't already used to eating this type of diet. Because if they're not and you try to switch them all of a sudden, it can be really dangerous because they don't have the oral facial muscles needed in order to eat this type of food. But the good news is there are devices out on the market now, like the MyoMesh baby feeders, you can probably pick them up on Amazon, where you can put a piece of frozen fruit or frozen vegetable in this mesh and the baby can chew on that safely, get that oral facial workout and then get the nutrition from the fruit or vegetable. So what do we know so far? Well, we know that most malocclusion is acquired, not inherited. We know that malocclusion is unique to Western culture, and we know that the presence of malocclusion is the key indicator of an underdeveloped airway. And we know that because of the research done by this man. This is Dr. James Sim Wallace, who was an orthodontist in the early 1900s, and he's really credited to being the father of modern preventative dentistry. And this is one of his direct quotes. He said, an early soft diet prevents the development of muscle fibers of the tongue, resulting in a weaker tongue, which cannot drive the primary dentition out into a spaced relationship with fully developed arches, which will lead to more crowding of the permanent teeth. That's a mouthful, pun intended. But what does that mean? Well, essentially, it means the tongue is the scaffold for our upper jaws. So much like the scaffold in our home holds our roof in place, the tongue holds the roof of our mouth in place. So what were to happen if the scaffold in our home were to suddenly disappear? Well, we would get bricks that shift and a roof that likely collapses. 
Well, likewise, if the tongue is not in its proper place holding our roof of our mouth in place, we're going to get teeth that shift. And instead of a roof of a mouth that collapses, it's going to vault and we're going to get a maxillary arch that looks like this gothic arch here instead of this nice wide U-shaped arch. This tongue was doing its job, right? So now let's talk about the maxilla. You might have heard this term before and you might be thinking it's your upper jaw. And you're not wrong, it is your upper jaw, but it's actually a little bit more than that. So everything highlighted in gold in this picture here is our maxilla. And so yes, it's our upper jaw, but it's also the floor of our sinuses and it makes up a portion of the orbits of our eyes. So if we have a maxilla that is underdeveloped and that's because the tongue isn't in its proper position, it's going to vault upwards. And it's going to vault upwards because as we talk and as we eat and as we go about our daily life, our oral facial muscles are putting pressure on our maxilla as it develops. So if the tongue's not in its proper place putting that counter pressure, we're gonna have a vault. And when our maxilla vaults, that means the roof of our mouth is up. And when the roof of our mouth is up, what do you think that does to our sinus cavity? Well, it blocks it. So now this quote by Dr. Christian Gumineau, who headed uh, Stanford University, um, He's, this is one of his direct quotes. He said, our results suggest that dental arch expansion improves SDB, which stands for sleep disorder breathing, in patients with upper and lower jaw constriction and can be valid treatment. So here we have our maxillary arch that is vaulted. And if we expand it, we get it wider and we get that palate to drop a little bit. What does that do to our sinus cavity? Well, it opens it up and it's, uh, we're able to breathe better through our noses. Now let's tie that into how that works with our overall airway. So here we have a modern skull or somebody from the 1940s. And as you can see, they have this vaulted palate. They have the malocclusion, they have the crooked teeth. And this is their airway right here. And as you can see, it's noticeably smaller than the prehistoric skull's airway. And you can notice that that maxilla is wider. It's more forward grown, it's not vaulted, and all of the teeth are in its proper place. So now let's talk about how all of this ties together in the functional airway. So if we have a maxilla that is vaulted and it's underdeveloped, it's going to push up into our sinuses, causing an upper airway restriction. And that's going to affect the development of our mandible. Because as we're growing, our mandible is going to grow to do whatever the maxilla is doing because our jaws naturally want to come together. So if we have an underdeveloped maxilla, that's going to stunt the growth, the growth of our mandible. Uh, and so the mandible, instead of being able to grow forward the way it was intended, it's going to be locked back in place. And when the mandible is locked back in place, it's going to be causing a lower airway restriction. So now I want you to think about your airway or your child's airway. What do you think you are breathing out of? Like a narrow coffee straw or a wide garden hose? And what does that actually look like? What does that actually mean, a narrow coffee straw airway? Well, take a look at these images. Uh, these are all various types of restricted airways. Here we have a severely constricted lower airway, a typical mouth breather, a child with Asperger's syndrome, and an adult with sleep apnea. And the main takeaway from these images are that white, blue uh, is good, and green, they're, they're all good. That's abundance of airflow. However, yellow is a moderate restriction and red is a severe restriction. So there can be various types of coffee straw airways or restricted airways. All right, so we're about halfway through and now I'd like to play a video for you from a company called Right to Grow. And this really is going to sum up everything that we just talked about in the first half of our video. Just a few hundred years ago, the human face was different. It was forward grown. Her wide profile and large dental arches ensured straight teeth and room for her tongue. Most importantly, she had plenty of space behind her upper jaw so she could breathe through her nose with ease. The modern face has changed. From childhood, her dental arches are less developed, crowding her teeth and giving her less space for her tongue which impacts her airway. Many believe this stems from a number of causes, such as allergies that affect breathing. Another is the poor nutrition and softness of modern diets, causing toddlers to have underdeveloped chewing muscles and smaller dental arches. 
Because her upper jaw is too far back, she will struggle to breathe normally through her nose. To get more oxygen, she will compensate by opening her mouth to breathe, bringing her lower jaw down and back, creating a downswing of the face. This is how her undergrown upper jaw creates the appearance of buck teeth. She's actually compensating in order to breathe. If not corrected, the problem carries into adulthood. Extractions were documented in the 1600s as a way to treat crowding. Although they are a quick fix, they don't treat the problem of underdeveloped arches and have been implicated in harming the facial profile, making them the subject of much debate even today. Adulthood. In order to breathe, she will slouch her head forward to prop open her airway, creating a lifetime of neck and back pain. This is the infamous forward head posture. Having a healthy airway is crucial to the survival of life, and especially so during sleep. When muscles around the throat relax during sleep, a healthy airway stays open because the tongue is sitting forward and has enough space to be suctioned up against the fully grown palate. With underdeveloped jaws and dental arches, the palate is too small for the fully grown tongue, which is sitting back to begin with. When she sleeps, her tongue does not suction, rather it falls back and cuts off her airway. This is obstructive sleep apnea. Like crooked teeth, it's a modern condition, however, it can reduce life expectancy. Not surprisingly, obstructive sleep apnea is marked by the same traits that describe the headgear effect. Both jaws are grown down and back, creating a clockwise rotation in the lower third of the face. The myth of the overgrown upper jaw that needs to be held back has long since been replaced with science. Science has shown that young children can be buck-toothed naturally and that the lower jaw catches up over time with a fully developed upper jaw. Essential to this is nutrition, the use of chewing muscles early on in life, and good breathing habits. This means breathing through the nose with the mouth closed and the tongue resting up against the palate. Also, the practice of maxillary expansion has been shown for over a century to correct crooked teeth and improve nasal breathing space. And since 1918, orofacial exercises have been shown to correct mouth breathing habits. video, the narrator talks about what happens when our tongue can't suction to the roof of our mouth while we're sleeping. It can fall back and create an apneic event. And if you've never seen what it looks like when a child is struggling to breathe when they sleep, I'm about to show you one. Now, this can be difficult to watch, especially if you do have littles in your life, but it is so important to understand the warning signs of what it looks like when a child is struggling to breathe when they sleep. Now, this is little Eli, and Eli's mom, who is a registered nurse, is the one who filmed this video. And what I'd like you to do is pay attention to how many times he stops breathing when he's sleeping. The sound of his breathing at the start of this video versus the sound of his breathing at the end of this video. Now he's holding it. That was holding it. He's still holding it. He's trying to take in air. There he goes. Can you watch? He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's still holding his breath. And now he's going to gulp again. There he goes. That was it again. And again. He's holding. He's holding. He's trying. There he goes. So this has been 3 minutes and 15 seconds, and you can see how many episodes he's had of not getting calm breaths in. Now, watch what happens when I take his jaw. 
And I just bring it forward. If I can, let's see if I can. And I open his airway. Just bring his airway forward. Airway. I'm opening his airway, just pulling his jaw forward ever so slightly. And now he's breathing through his nose quietly. His mouth is a little bit open, but he's breathing through his nose. Just by hear how quietly he's breathing, you don't hear him anymore. And all I did is gently bring his jaw forward. Difficult to watch, but also begs the question, what is that doing to little Eli's development, not being able to breathe for 10, 11, 12 seconds at a time when he sleeps? Now, again, this just highlights the importance of proper jaw development, because when that lower jaw is not growing forward the way it should, it's going to be locked back in place, creating a lower airway restriction and possibly apneic events as we sleep. So now let's talk about the difference between nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. Now before I knew what I know now, I thought that as long as I can breathe through my mouth, I'm winning, right? As long as you're breathing, it's the same thing, but it's not. See, when we breathe through our nose, air goes through our nostrils into our sinuses and then our parasinuses where it is warmed, it is filtered, and it's humidified, and it's mixed with a substance called nitric oxide, which is created in our sinuses. And nitric oxide is a vasodilator and it has many functions, uh, but some of them are anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antiviral and antifungal, and it also helps our bodies absorb oxygen more efficiently out of the air. And then from our parasinuses, it goes right into our lungs for proper assimilation into the bloodstream. Now, if we have an upper airway restriction, we can't breathe through our nose, we're gonna open up our mouths and breathe through there. And there, all that raw air is gonna go right in into the back of our throats. And that's where our tonsils and our adenoids live. And they're not meant to be filtration systems. So they get aggravated and sometimes they swell, which is going to further impede our ability to breathe. And then all of that raw, unwarmed, unfiltered air has to go into our lungs. And most of the time that's going to mean that our bodies are gonna to have to work a little bit harder to warm that air up because we cannot absorb oxygen if it's not at body temperature. So it might have to work a little bit harder to heat that air up. And then because it's not mixed with the nitric oxide, that vas vasodilator, it's not absorbing as much oxygen out of that air. So our bodies actually have to work a little bit harder to get a little bit less oxygen. To further highlight the importance of proper nasal breathing and oral facial development, I want to introduce you to the research done by Dr. Eagle Harvold, who did research on adolescent rhesus monkeys. And uh, what he noted was that nasal obstruction leads to mouth breathing, mouth breathing leads to low tongue posture, and low tongue posture leads to malocclusion, just like in humans. So here we go, we have a monkey that before its nose was blocked, this is its natural face, and this is its face directly after its mouth was blocked. Notice how the mouth is now open because they can no longer breathe through their nose. And notice actually the physiology of the face changes a little bit. And that's actually a, a term that has been recently coined as long face syndrome. And it describes the long-term effects that we, that we can experience uh, when we breathe through our mouth versus breathing through our nose. And then because the mouth is open, they have to lower their tongue to breathe. And when that tongue is not in the proper position, they get malocclusion. Now, as far as I know, these monkeys went back to leaving a normal life as soon as the noses were unblocked. They went back right back to breathing through their noses. Uh, but now this just really highlights, again, the importance of proper tongue posture because when we are breathing through our mouths, that means our tongue is not in its proper position. And when our tongue is not in its proper position, we have low tongue posture, and that's going to lead to a vaulted palate and crowded and crooked teeth. And we are going to be breathing through our noses, which means our tonsils and adenoids are going to swell, which is going to further impede our ability to breathe properly. 
Now I'd like to introduce you to the research done by Dr. Sten Linder Arnson. Uh, Dr. Arnson did research on children. This picture is a little bit misleading. He did not block their noses. Rather, Dr. Arnson studied children who were already mouth breathers and children who were already nasal breathers. And what he found is that children who were breathing through their mouths often had low tongue posture. They had higher rates of male occlusion. And these children were also more underdeveloped than children who were breathing through their nose and often had lower IQs than the children who were breathing through their nose. The children who were breathing through their noses were, you know, more developed and they had higher IQs. So what does this tell us? Well, it's really important for our children to breathe through their nose, especially in their younger years, those developmental years. It's very important for their overall development. Now, in the beginning of this video, I talked a little bit about ADD, ADHD, and how you might be watching this because you have a child that suffers from it. Now, you might be thinking, why is my dentist talking about my child's ADD and ADHD? And how can a child's sleep and breathing possibly be linked? Well, when you have a child who is not sleeping well at night, you're going to have a child who is not able to behave properly throughout the day. And I'd love to be able to talk further on this subject. However, However, I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. His, na his name is Dr. Ben Moralia. He's a dentist who has been treating children for decades, and he is going to describe the possible link between sleep disordered breathing and things like ADD and ADHD. Now take a child, alter their quality of breathing and sleeping, and the real big issue now is how will they be during the day? So now you take a child who's five, six, seven, eight, it doesn't matter. Their issue has begun years ago. So it's not like you had one or two bad nights of sleep. You've had a poor quality of sleeping and breathing for years. Mm -hmm. And the parents have been struggling with so many different issues, and not the least of which is the ADD, ADHD discussion. Because the child who doesn't get a proper night's sleep with a good quality of breathing throughout the entire night is going to wake up and be unrested. And when you get a child who's had a poor quality night's sleep, or breathing all night long, and you make that happen for years, you know what you've got? A six, seven, or eight-year-old that's gonna to go to school and have trouble learning, have trouble sitting still, have trouble behaving, have trouble cooperating, basically have trouble fitting in to what is supposed to be a quiet and peaceful and learning environment, and it's not long after that where the phone call comes to the parent. And when the phone call comes to the parent from the school, what happens is, we have little Jimmy here and he's a little bit disruptive and we really want you to have him evaluated for ADD and ADHD. They're going to be diagnosed with ADD and ADHD, and our solutions are pharmaceutical. If we are given a pharmaceutical, it's usually in the form of some sort of a stimulant. And what that does to the child is it kind of pushes them over the edge, and it brings them back to calm. So you basically take an excited or hyperactive child, you stimulate them more, and you bring them back to so-called calm. But it doesn't make a better learning child. You're not going to have a child who's able to learn as well. So now you might have the child sitting still in class because they might be a little more numb or relaxed or calm, but it doesn't necessarily make them a better learner. If we have the so-called ADD, ADHD diagnosis, we're talking about hyperactivity. We're talking about all of the things about behavior and development that land in this category. And the interesting thing about research is, and there is current, ongoing, and past research that shows, children who are sleep deprived produce the same exact symptoms as kids who are diagnosed with ADD and ADHD. In fact, there's a nice study that showed children who were diagnosed with ADD and ADHD were mixed with children who were sleep deprived. And in that group of kids, when they tried to analyze them and look at their symptoms and diagnose them, they couldn't tell them apart. And if you have a group of kids and you can't tell apart who's an ADD child and who's a sleep deprived child, it's no surprise that maybe the ADD and ADHD has a cause. And maybe that cause has to do with the quality of the breathing and the sleeping overnight. And there's a lot of research out there. And one of the, one of the pioneers here is a Dr. Stephen Sheldon out of Laurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. And he does a wonderful job of researching. And over the decades, he's come to a conclusion. And I, I, I've seen him speak. And it's not soon after he jumps on stage and he makes a statement that ADHD and ADD do not exist. They are an outcome of a sleep disorder breathing. They're an outcome of a poor quality of sleep. It's all about the quality of sleep. Another researcher who's produced beautiful research on the same topic is Dr. Karen Bonnick out of Einstein at Yeshiva University. Dr. Karen Bonnick has the largest study to date. 11,000 children were watched over seven years, and they were divided into two groups, sleep disorder breathing children and children who do not have sleep disorder breathing issues. 
The children in the sleep disorder breathing group, over their seven years, her study showed that they were 50% more likely to be diagnosed with an ADD or ADHD diagnosis and treated with medication. 50% is a coin toss for our child to be diagnosed and treated with a medication. Also in her group, they were doing testing. They were doing IQ or intelligence testing along those seven years. And the children with the sleep disorder breathing, their, their intelligence testing, their IQ scores were dropping over those seven years. And that's really not the way it works when you're growing and forming. The formative growing years for a child when they're sleeping and breathing well, your IQ raises to a certain point and then you kind of plateau. We don't see IQs diminishing amongst children. So Dr. Moralia mentioned the research done by Dr. Karen Bonick. I'm just going to wrap that up again for you. So she studied 11,000 children over the course of six or seven years. And what she found is that there is a strong and persistent association between sleep disordered breathing and diminished IQ. And that sleep disorder breathing increases the risk of your child being diagnosed by AD, with ADD or ADHD by about 50%. Because again, if you put a bunch of sleep deprived children and children who have been diagnosed with ADD and ADHD in a room, you really can't tell them apart. Also, in the beginning of this video, I mentioned that you might be watching this because your child has been having issues wetting the bed and your dentist might be able to help. Well, now you might be thinking, okay, how can my dentist help with my child's bedwetting issue? Well, I'm going to let Dr. Ben Moralia explain that one as well. Another thing that might happen is bedwetting. Bedwetting, it's a little more common than people are aware because it's also a best kept secret. Not many people are running around and advertising that their child is bedwetting at the age of five, six, seven, 10, 14 years old. But bedwetting does have a relationship to how we're breathing and our quality of sleep. And some of the causes for bedwetting relate to the, the way oxygen is exchanged in our body. And the way I'll describe it is this. If we're breathing through our mouth, that air coming into the lung isn't really filtered, warmed, or humidified appropriately, and the body can't exchange it appropriately. So a little less oxygen goes to the brain. Now the brain is a very sensitive organ. When the brain recognizes little changes in oxygen, it goes to work immediately. Because once the brain starts to recognize a little less oxygen, it doesn't know if we're being choked to death, a very serious condition, or if there's an imbalance in how we're breathing at night. But it does start to trigger a little bit of the fight or flight response. And a little bit of the fight or flight response means the brain's gonna look at the body and say, all right, if we've got a little bit of an oxygen issue going on, I'm gonna pull oxygen from something that it picks to be unnecessary right now and maybe deliver it somewhere that might be more important, planning on the a, a rare occurrence as if the oxygen was gonna stop. So if the brain's recognizing a little less oxygen, all of a sudden it's pulled from the urinary tract. If the body pulls a little oxygenation from the urinary tract, it might void. So we might wet the bed. So what can we possibly do? And how can we possibly help? Well, it might not be what you think. So I'd like to share this video with you about Connor Deegan, and this is a story of hope. Connor experienced some uh, behavioral issues as a child, and his mother was at her wit's end. And finally, after seeing a dentist and getting his airway treated, he transformed into a completely different kid. Now, this video was filmed by Connor's mom. There's no talking or anything like that in here. It's just music and text. So please pay attention because this story is so powerful.
So what do we do now? Hopefully at this part in the video, you understand why you're at the dental office talking about your sleeping and breathing and airway. And now comes my favorite part in this presentation because I get to show you what we could actually do about it. Starting with Hunter. So this is Hunter. He's a 10 year old little boy who went into treatment. And these are his before photos. And these are his photos just 10 months into treatment. Now, if you take a look at his bite here, he has what's called a deep bite, where basically when he smiles, you can barely see his bottom teeth. And also, if you take a look at these little two white pokey things here, well, those are his adult teeth coming in. And they're coming in above the baby teeth because there's just no room for them. But fast forward 10 months, let's take a look at his smile now. His bottom jaw is coming forward and here are his adult teeth coming in with plenty of room. And you can really see this forward growth uh, exemplified in his profile. Here before treatment, he has kind of a flatter face, not much of a jawline. Uh, but here you can see where his jaw starting to come forward. He has that jawline and he really gets that forward growth. Again, this was just 10 months into treatment. But the really cool part about this story is that he stopped wetting the bed after just one week. So when his dentist called him to check up to, to see how he was doing with the oral appliance, uh, his parents were ecstatic because they said he stopped wetting the bed. He actually refused to take it out of his mouth because he knew this is what was helping him. Now Hunter is 10 years old. Up until this point, he couldn't do sleepovers with his friends. He couldn't go on camping trips. And now he can do all of that. And his parents were so, so happy. They wanted to see what this type of treatment can do for their daughter, Paige. Well, here she is. Look at little Paige. Check out her deep bite. You, you can't even see her bottom teeth when she smiled. And fast forward again, just 10 months, her bottom jaw is starting to come forward and she has noticeably more room for her adult teeth. And take a look at her profile pictures. She went from a little girl to a young woman in just 10 months. Here you can see where her face is a little bit flat, no jaw definition whatsoever. And here you see that forward grown face, nice jaw definition. Again, this is a really remarkable transformation. And speaking of remarkable transformation, do you remember Michael? Well, here he is. He started treatment at age nine and ended at age 14. And this is just, again, oral appliance therapy. No traditional braces were done for his case. So here is his profile picture at age nine. There's that little chubby cheek and that double chin here. And age 14, he's grown quite a bit in those five years, but take a look at his jawline. That double chin is completely gone and he's way more forward grown. So if you take a line and you draw it right down here, you can see that his chin is barely above that line where at age 14, he has so much forward growth. Here's that deep bite again. Now take a look at that beautiful smile. In the dental world, this is just perfection. But in the airway world, this is just the cherry on the sundae because this is what we're going after. Take a look at Michael's coffee straw airway versus his garden hose airway. Take a look at that forward head posture that he had. He had such a small airway, he really had to move his head forward in order to open up to breathe. And here he's nice and straight. So if only we had known, right? What about my child? What about my spouse or me? I did spend a lot of time talking about children, so how can we help adults? Well, meet Dr. Tara Griffin. Dr. Griffin is a dentist down in Florida, and she was her own first patient. And just like the other kiddos, this is her before photo, and this is her after photo a really impeccable transformation. And I'd love to be able to tell you more about Dr. Griffin, but I think it would mean more coming from Tara herself. I'm Dr. Tara Griffin. We are here today in my clinic in Panama City Beach. I've been practicing dentistry for over 11 years. Before I discovered the Vivos Appliance, I was suffering every day with chronic head and neck pain, TMJ pain. I was practicing dentistry and been practicing for five years, but I was already looking for an out. I knew that with this much pain, I could not continue to practice dentistry. I had chronic sinus and allergy problems, bronchitis, 
Um, I was not sleeping throughout the night very well, I was waking up during the night. I had severe daytime fatigue where I would need to go home and actually take a nap in the afternoon just at lunch, you know? And so I was looking for a solution to the problem, but I didn't know what the root cause was until I learned about the Vivo Suppliance. As soon as I started treatment with the Vivo Suppliance, within the first two nights, I was sleeping soundly throughout the night. My energy was better during the day. The pain that I was undergoing took a bit longer to get resolved, but within the first three to four weeks, my pain level was reduced by two thirds or more. Within a month's period of time, I was breathing through my nose better. I wasn't having the same sinus symptoms that I was having before. And within three months of treatment, my asthma had improved so much, I had no more problems with the inhalers and the frequency I was having to use with all of my asthma inhalers. My overall health started to improve very quickly. I was my own first patient. However, as I continued to treat the next patient and the next patient going forward, I was curious to see if they were gonna have the same outcome that I had, and they did. Nine out of 10 had the very similar outcome that I had. So they were sleeping better in just a few nights actually getting their energy back. Uh, they were less irritable. The pain that they had was going away very quickly. The teeth were beginning to straighten and align over time. So even though with this type of problem, it can take some time to get the long-term results, the immediate symptoms start to improve very quickly. Comparing my before and after picture with the Vivo Suppliance, uh, my smile was not symmetrical. My teeth were crowded. Uh, the gumminess of my smile was a, was a major problem that I didn't like. I had unevenness in my eyes, um, also in my nose. My face was more round and less balanced, and that all helped to correct itself as well as I went through the treatment. When the Vivos appliance is worn in the early evening and while you sleep at night, it allows the jaw to relax. It allows the airway to open up. It allows you to breathe through your nose and to get the oxygen that you need to the rest of your body for your body to begin to heal. By breathing through our nose, we are actually getting much more oxygen to our brain as well as our lungs and we're producing nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator to allow the blood flow and everything to circulate better. And so a big component with this is it forces you to actually breathe through your nose to get the oxygen where it needs to go into the body. So that's a very important part of this. If you're interested in learning more about the Vivo Suppliance, if this would be good for you, then I recommend you coming in to a Vivo Center to be evaluated to determine if this is something that could help you. So in her testimony, Dr. Griffin talks about how much better she felt. And this is how we're able to achieve that. Now, this is not Dr. Griffin's airway, but it is an airway of another adult patient. And as you can see by these figures, remember the red, the yellow, those are restrictions. Didn't have hardly any green, no blue, no white. But after 15 months of treatment, drastically changed the size of their airway. And if you look down here, their upper airway went from 7.7 .7 cubic centimeters to 24.1 cubic centimeters cubic centimeters. Now that's a growth of over three times. And their lower airway went from 120 millimeters squared to 276.5 millimeters squared. That's more than double the size of the airway. So you can imagine how much better this individual was feeling. And the airway results are great. But we also get to see some really cool aesthetic changes as well, because as we're expanding those maxillary arches, our faces are changing a little bit. And this woman went through a pretty remarkable change. This is her before treatment, and this is her just 12 months into our oral appliance therapy. What changes do you notice? Well, for me, I see brighter eyes, straighter nose, and a straighter smile. We're really able to achieve remarkable clinical outcomes, just like Christy. So Christy went to her dentist wanting to fix her gummy smile because she knew she had a retromathic jaw.
Now, originally, Christy saw an oral surgeon for this type of surgery, like an MMA surgery. And her surgeon said, yep, absolutely, I can help you. So what we're going to do is we're going to take your maxillary arch off of your skull, move it forward, stitch it back onto your skull. Then we're going to wire your jaw shut for about six weeks. And this is the amount of pain you can expect. And this is going to be your bill. And she went, hold on a second, there has to be another way. So she found a dentist out in Colorado and said, can you help me fix my dent gummy smile? And he said, yeah, of course. Of course, he was thinking about how is she breathing? How is she sleeping? What's her overall health like? But she was just concerned with the aesthetic changes. And ladies and gentlemen, I think she achieved it. Notice here, she has her retronathic jaw that is set so far back, and after treatment, it's more forward grown. She wanted to fix her gummy smile, and she definitely achieved that. But the cool portion is, is she started to see some health benefits as well. So this is Christy's own words. She was a blogger, and this is her testimony. When smiling, I noticed I am now physically unable to smile as big as I used to. My gums are now barely showing. My face feels different when I smile now. I don't know how to explain it, but it's a great thing. She goes on to say, when I speak and eat, my jaw no longer pops. I can speak more clearly and have a noticeable difference in the amount of room my tongue has. I can breathe very well through my nose now, and I'm very happy with my results. Again, she was just concerned with the aesthetic changes, and she just listed four health benefits she wasn't even anticipating. But how did we do all this? Well, it starts by expanding the dental arches. It also starts with promoting healthy nasal breathing by training the tongue to stay in the proper position and eliminating bad habits. And that all starts with proper medical screening, going to your dentist and filling out paperwork and surveys to see just how you're sleeping at night. And then that your dentist is going to create a personalized treatment plan just for you based off of your needs. And that's going to include oral appliance therapy that's going to be custom or a guide for our children. And we also are going to include other medical professionals in your treatment. We might include a myofunctional therapist to give you that orofacial workout and to train your tongue to stay in its proper position in your mouth. We might refer you to an ENT to have allergy testing or to have your tonsils and adenoids removed. We might even refer you to an atlas orthogonist chiropractor to help get that forward head posture fixed. And then finally, we're going to do this with a state-of-the-art technology. We're going to get a 3D scan of your skull and your airway. We're going to get a 3D scan of your mouth. And we're even going to give you a home sleep test that you can take and use in the comfort of your own home and your own bed. And we can collect the data on just how you sleep at night. Now, before I end my video, I just wanted to thank you so much again for taking the time out of your day to listen to me teach you about airway, sleeping, and breathing, and how your dentist can help. I have one more video to show you, uh, but before we depart, I just again wanted to say thank you and welcome to the sleeping and breathing movement. I really feel like Vivos is one of the great answers to the healthcare crisis that's in America because we're getting to the root cause of what ails a lot of us, and that is not breathing well and not sleeping well. If you trace back the journey of a, of a sleep apnea patient, that patient is suffering for years before they ever get diagnosed. Once they are diagnosed, they're presented really with two fundamental options. You can go into CPAP and wear a contraption over your face, every night for the rest of your life, or you can have what's called a mandibular advancement device, which will actually protrude your lower jaw in an unnatural position to hold your airway open while you sleep, and you can wear that for the rest of your life. Either of those two modalities are going to present that patient with a, a life sentence of having to wear this, this contraption, one or the other, for the, every night for the rest of their life. The interesting thing about uh, CPAP and oral appliances is although they're very effective treatments, if they're used over a lifetime, the person's condition actually gets worse over time. Along comes Vivos and says, wait a minute, we have a better option that's all natural, non-invasive, non-pharmaceutical. We can say to a patient, you go into this oral appliance therapy with our protocols and you go through this treatment for 12 to 24 months and at the end of that time, there's a high, high probability that you will no longer have to wear an appliance or any kind of device. Vivos is literally changing my patients' lives. It has drastically changed my life. I don't have to use the CPAP anymore. Within just a couple of weeks of using the appliance, I was able to breathe through both nostrils, something I couldn't do my entire life. 
This was revolutionary. Pretty much made me feel excited about life again. She's sleeping better, I'm sleeping better. You really feel like you've been given a new life. It's amazing. I wake up and I'm not in pain. Because she's sleeping better, because her attitude during the day is better. Mm -hmm. I have a better quality of life now. I can't say enough good about it. I'm getting instant benefit from it. I was amazed. I dreamed every night for two weeks straight, and I told my wife, I said, it's amazing. I feel sharp now. I don't, I don't feel drowsy all the time. It's been a long time since I felt this good. I wouldn't lay down and try to sleep right now without my Vivos device. My asthma has gotten much, much better. Without the Vivos, I wouldn't be outside right now. There's no numerical value you can put on this kind of a change. I smile and I haven't smiled for a long time. <laughs> right after I started using it, I noticed the results really, especially with the snoring. My sleep apnea episodes are a fraction of what they were before. This product's phenomenal. It's, uh, it changed my life. It's a very comfortable process, but I can see dramatic differences. Now I can really open my mouth. Before it would almost always click. His ADHD is calming down, he's doing better in school. I can definitely see the difference and the change in him. It's a miracle. <laughs> I get to do things now that I would not have been able to. I would not hesitate to do it again. I am 100% happy that I did this, and I am thankful every day that I have it because I can breathe. We bring hope to the millions of people and the millions of families, men, women, and children who suffer from this disease. It promotes the body's own ability to heal itself because now the body can breathe and sleep well. That's exciting. Now you might have some questions rattling around in your brain. Now let me help answer some of the most common ones. Some of the most common questions are, does this hurt? Absolutely not. This is a pain-free, it's non-invasive, non-surgical, non-pharmaceutical. So if you decide to go into treatment and pop this bad boy into your mouth, you'll understand that there's no pain at all associated with this treatment. How long am I gonna have to wear my oral appliance? Well, that all depends on how long your treatment plan is going to be, but typical ranges are anywhere from 18 to 24 months. Now, you might have some further questions that your dental team would be more than happy to answer for you. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and have a great day.